was an HP News Network special report. Okay, YouTubers and anti-nuke activists, I want to talk very briefly about the consortium. I want to talk about a diverging perspective. I want to talk about spent fuel pool number four, fire and release of radiation. And I want to talk about a statement from Ariva back in 2011. And I want to kind of show you how there's some discrepancies. Okay, and that's putting it nicely. Okay, if we look at this first screen capture I have from the NRC Freedom of Information Act documents, free and available to the public online. This bottom section is what I'm concerned with in this video. Industry consortium slash contractor activities. And this is what they publicly want you to know about the consortium. The industry consortium is composed of government and industry representatives working to respond to Government of Japan, GOJ, requests for material and assistance. Consortium calls are typically held, typically held daily on technical issues at 11, so on and so forth. Important thing to note here is they claim publicly it's composed of government and industry representatives working to respond as if they're working together as, as one unit and, and they're all kind of equal. Okay, let's look at the next screen capture from the FOIA documents. This is Steve Lyons speaking. He says, I think it would be useful for the industry group to define the kinds of capabilities that you would like in any sort of a federal liaison or federal role. That would help us identify the best agency and the best, the best individuals to provide that support. Now what we kind of take out of this uh, bit from the FOIA documents is that the industry group is kind of leading the response to Fukushima. The consortium, the industry, okay, these corporations, they're going to be defining the government role, the federal role. And to me this one was a big a blockbuster find when I read it and kind of took into account what it means and that kind of means we're under this fascist kind of control right now where the corporations are much more powerful than anything else. They're transnational corporations and indeed they do define the role of governments around the world. So this is Steve Lyons kind of saying, saying as much here. At least that's what I get out of it. You may interpret it your own way. Next screen capture says DOE has agreed the U.S. should reach out to Japan as one voice only. To facilitate this, DOE were provided a summary of the 1000 industry consortium call. And then it goes on to say, this will help facilitate the one voice. Okay, um, what you want to take out of that is this one voice. What they want is a united front as far as this cover up, this deception. They want to make sure everybody's on the same page. You don't want five. Uh, robbers apprehended in a bank robbery and each guy given a different story and that's that's not a good thing so they're trying to get organized and get their story straight next screen capture kinda solidifies that and all this is in my book something wicked this way comes and it's free and available as well on my website and on the WordPress blog in this screen capture it says supported chairman's attendance at the principals meeting some external concern parentheses DOD comma NRC close parentheses that a diverging perspective may have inadvertently been developed through various communications. This particular issue appears to be addressed regarding the quote current severity and need for expediency end quote of implementation of the US recommended SAMG actions, a severe accident, something like that, guidelines and actions. So what they're saying here is they're concerned about a diverging perspective inadvertently developed through various communications and in particular they want to make sure everyone is on the same page they say this multiple times I'm just using a couple quick examples that I have although I have numerous examples they want to be aligned they want to be on the same page a united voice and avoid a diverging perspective and this is all going to make sense to you while I'm talking about this in just a second we get to Ariva and the statement Ariva made back in April of 2011 next screen capture this is an email from March 14th, and this is from like a committee, LIA06. I think that's a group of people working together, and it's sent out to a number of people, including Elliot Brenner, the uh, head of the OPA, the ringleader of the cover-up, if you will. And it says, this, this email is primarily for Charlie and Rosetta to close the loop. 
We discussed the need for providing consistent information to the states via the RSLOs with the executive team and the chairman a few minutes ago. The chairman directed us to coordinate with FEMA since they have an established relationship with the states. We are settled on working with OPA to provide the information tailored to our best extent to the questions and concerns that would be expressed by the states and provide to FEMA for awareness and commonality and then the RSLOs for sharing. A broad conference call with all states is not currently being contemplated. We'd like to see how providing a common set of information works first. Okay, and what you want to really concentrate on the bottom of this thing right here, of course they say providing inf consistent information to the states, but in a second I'm going to show you where they withhold information to the states. Okay, so that's not entirely true. But the bottom, let's look at this broad conference call is not currently being contemplated. They're avoiding this conference call. What they want to do is shove some information and say, here, here's what you need to know. Okay, and they're hoping they settle for that and don't ask any more questions. That would be really nice if that happened, right? Unfortunately, people are asking questions. And the states should be asking questions when you look at this next screen capture. And this is a big one right here. Well, number one, I might mention there's talk of mock sludge. And this isn't the best one I have because one says they have access problems due to MOX sludge. That's a mixed oxide, plutonium, uranium. Access problems due to MOX sludge. I'll try to throw that one in here as well. I don't have it in this file uh, on hand at the moment. Okay, the bottom section we want to look at here relevant to what I'm talking about in this video. And it says clearly, uh, Mark Schaefer has requested permission to share the NRC sit rep, the situation report with the Chinese government. OIP was advised this document should not be shared. Concerns with any plan to share the SITREP with the Chinese government are, and might I add Hillary Clinton had access to that. Number one, U.S. states have been denied access to this document. And two, if we share the document with the Chinese government, this precedent could obligate us to honor requests from other international stakeholders as well. <laughs> Okay, so although they say states should make the decision about potassium iodine and states should be the ones that the general public you know, calls and, and will be giving them information, they're denying the states critical information. They don't want to give out information to everybody. So right there, how can the states make an informed decision when you're withholding pertinent information? Question. Okay, next screen capture. Okay, let's talk about, we've talked about the consortium. We've talked about the one voice of diverging perspective. Let's look at spent fuel pool number four, which myself, Shazam, and a number of other uh, researchers are saying that the worst of the worst has pretty much already happened there. It's a lot of scare tactics going on right now. Let's look at what IAEA publicly admitted on the 15th of March, 2011. And it says, subject, release of radioactivity from Unit 4 of Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Plant. At 4.50 UTC, that's also known as Zulu time, the military time, on 15 March 2011, the IAEA was informed by the Japanese authorities that the spent fuel storage pond at Unit 4 of the Daiichi nuclear power plant is on fire and radioactivity is being released directly into the atmosphere. Dose rates up to 400 millisievert per hour have been reported at the site. There is the possibility that the fire has been caused by a hydrogen explosion. And this came out at 510 UTC on the 15th of March 2011. So here's in minutes the spent fuel pond pool at Unit 4 is on fire. Radioactivity being directly released into the atmosphere. Now let's see, do we have evidence how long this fire lasted for? And what I found was a, uh, get to the next screen capture here. Another report from the IAEA says subject release of radioactivity from Unit 4 of Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. At 7.20 U2C on 15 March 2011, the IAEA was informed by the Japanese authorities that the fire at the spent fuel storage pond at Unit 4, the Daiichi nuclear power plant was extinguished at 2.00 hours UTC. Okay, my calculations, that comes to 9 hours and 10 minutes. Of a, of a burn time where radiation is being directly released into the atmosphere. Okay, next screen capture, I just want to show you the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. There's their logo and here's what they have to say. This is a news release 
and there's different dates depending on what's going on here. The purpose of this first screen capture was for me to show you there's a lot of discussion about water spray. Water cannon spraying, water drop spraying the spent fuel pool, and it looks real nice, and it probably looks good on TV when the cannons are you know, shooting water all over the spent fuel pool or Unit 3 or whatever it is. But the fact of the matter is throughout the NRC FOIA documents, there's a lot of discussion that these are pretty much ineffective or marginally effective at best. Now let's look what uh, Mr. Casto, Chuck Casto, had to say about this. He says, let me add one more thing from the cabinet meeting tonight. They reported on spent fuel pool number four. Today they continue to pour water on it from above and they've observed no substantial change to external dose. That was what they reported on Unit 4 tonight. Now why is that little segment important? Because this just again bolsters the case which I've provided time and time again from Chairman Jaxco to Casto to you name it, saying that these water drops and water cannons are ineffective. And here's the admittance right here. They pour water on it from above and there's no substantial change to the external dose, which means it's not being effective. It's not dropping the dose rates down and it's not cooling anything or changing anything substantially. So all the time this thing is sitting there, even these water cannons and water drops, they're ineffective. There's no water flow, there's no power flow to the facility. It's called a prolonged station blackout. Okay, here is a screen capture of an email from March 15th and a discussion of Unit 4. Down at the bottom there's some interesting things to note here. Number one, it says fire began four to five hours ago. No firefighting activity due to high RAD levels. And I thought that was important to show because the point is sometimes in one of these catastrophic meltdown accidents the radiation is so intense and so high workers cannot immediately go in they wouldn't last long if they did. So they're, they're unable to make repairs or try to rectify the situation or stabilize the situation because the radiation is too intense for a human being to go in and survive any amount of time. And might I add, robots don't last forever either. I thought, hey, send in the robots. That's how you solve it. No. You have to have gamma-hardened robots from Sandia is what they talk about because the others don't last very long in the high radiation. This is just a kind of close-up, this next screen capture of what I just talked about. Spent fuel pool level reported to be very low. Well, I have a lot of evidence and I have a special coming up on the Unit 4 where I assemble all my information. You can see there's a crack, the water drained out, there's discussion of it. You know, sloshing couldn't have account for it, it couldn't have boiled off that quick, and they settle and there has to be a crack. TEPCO's not forthright with them, and it's a back and forth and a long story. They even talk about pouring sand into the spent fuel pool, because obviously they can't uh, patch the crack and, and contain and keep water inside the spent fuel. It's draining out quicker they can get it in there. And I show evidence, thanks to Shazam, where they have some professionals, they do a discussion about a quote-unquote junk shot where they're going to apply this particular compound. It's a two-part solution. You have to put it in a specific way to plug and clog up those cracks, to seal those cracks, where they can then try and fill spent fuel pool number four with water again because there's discussion of earthquake damage and that's likely what caused the water to drain out at such a high rate. And again, I'm going to cover this in great, great detail in a special I have coming up on Unit 4, but I'm still assembling information on that and want to have a as thorough and a complete examination from these documents as possible on, on spent fuel pool number four. Try to debunk some of the, you know, all sectors of media are not being uh, accurately reporting on spent fuel number pool number four. Let me put it that way. Okay, this next screen capture, chronology of Unit 4 after the earthquake. The 14th, water temperature, 84 degrees. 15th, damage of wall in the fourth floor confirmed. And this may be indicative the spent fuel pool had a crack too. If you have a wall damage, that's severe structural damage right there. And it could be indicative systemically that Unit 4 probably has cracks. And I don't deny maybe it could collapse, but many of us now have come to the conclusion after reading these documents thoroughly, thousands of pages, the worst has already happened there. We've already had a melt on the floor, and if it collapsed now, it wouldn't be much compared to what's already happened, comparatively speaking. So you see here on 20th water spray, 21st water spray by Defense Force. Sometimes that's either a cannon or the helicopter drops. 
injection of seawater, water spray, white smoke confirmed to generate. So you can see, even by the 30th, there's been no real resolution to spent fuel pool number four. And by then, certainly, if it's been dry any amount of time, you have a Zerk fire. I've showed the emails where they, they say Zerk fire, comma, catastrophe, and so on and so forth. I've got a, you guys have probably seen my video on spent fuel pool number four. If you haven't, I'll link to that in this presentation as well. Okay, and now we're going to talk about Ariva, and we're almost done with this video. Here's from an Ariva, kind of a press release, I suppose you might call it, from the 5th of April 2011, and they discuss spent fuel pool number four. Now, if you look back at the consortium and the one voice and diverging perspective, this is what they're trying to avoid. And here's Ariva, some kind of representative, I suppose, Dr. Matthias Braun, and in his little graphic here, where you look at spent fuel pool number four, at the bottom it says, it is currently unclear if release from fuel pool already happened. Well, we just went over abundant evidence already showing that at least the NRC and these other guys, TEPCO, uh, NISA, these guys were aware that there was a severe loss of water. There was a Zerk fire. The IEA shows you Japanese authorities admit that there's an ongoing fire nine hours and ten minutes released directly into the atmosphere. And yet on the 5th of April, these guys still don't seem to know about it. It's unconfirmed to them. And so this is the, they're trying to avoid this. And, and again, what does this show? A couple things here among everything else I discussed. Also, it shows inconsistencies, inconsistencies in the reporting and the information. And they want to tighten that in and rein that in and make sure everyone has the one voice. So everyone says, well, the fire, if there was a fire, they all admit the same time. It's not two hours or four hours or maybe it didn't even happen at all. Because then we can look at these guys and say, wow, your information is bunk. And you guys that disorganized? And well, are you not being honest with us? Right? So then you really begin to ask some more questions. I, and I find it decidedly convenient that Ariva on the 5th of April is publishing this and saying, ah, they don't really know if there's been any emissions or releases from that spent fuel pool. And they don't even say there's a fire necessarily here, right? So... Again, it's not much of an admission of information. They're not forthright with the information. When they are, it's not complete. It's not accurate all the time. And it's just part of the cover-up right here, folks. Okay, that's what I wanted to show you and kind of debunk Arriva on their statement from the 5th of April. And also show you that little segment from the IAEA, which confirms there was a fire and there were emissions released directly to the atmosphere by 9 hours and 10 minutes by my calculations of this UTC is also known as Zulu time, the military time. You just count from one point to the next, and I came up with nine hours and ten minutes, so we'll leave it at that. Thanks for joining me for this video. You guys have a good day. Patrick Penry, over and out. This has been an HP News Network special report. Uh, we need to get subscribe and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the Remix button, hit the Remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad.